Woodrow Wilson was elected the 28th president of the United States in 1912. He served two terms from March 4th, 1913 to March 4th, 1921. Born in 1856 in Virginia, he witnessed the Civil War during the 1860s. Prior to winning the White House, he was president of Princeton University, as well as the governor of the state of New Jersey. Wilson was considered a prominent liberal in his day, but as we will hear in a moment from his recordings, his views seem quite conservative by today's standards. Wilson suffered a debilitating stroke in October 1919, and his wife Edith assumed many of the duties of the presidency, although behind closed doors. It has been said that Mrs. Wilson was de facto the first woman president during her husband's last months in office. To look at the politics of the day from the viewpoint of the laboring man is not to suggest that there is one view proper to him, another to the employer, another to the capitalist, another to the professional man, but merely that the life of the country as a whole may be looked at from various points of view and yet be viewed as a whole. The whole business of politics is to bring classes together upon a platform of accommodation and common interest. In a political campaign, the voters are called upon to choose between parties and leaders. Parties and platforms and candidates should be frankly put under examination <clears throat> to see what they will yield us by way of progress. And there are a great many questions which the working man may legitimately ask and press until he gets a definite answer. The predictions of the leader of the new party are as alarming as the predictions of the various Stan Patterns. He declares that he is not troubled by the fact that a very large amount of money is taken out of the pocket of the general taxpayer and put into the pocket of particular classes of protected manufacturers, but that his concern is that so little of this money gets into the pocket of the laboring man and so large a proportion of it into the pockets of the employer. I have searched his program very thoroughly for an indication of what he expects to do in order to see to it that a larger proportion of this prize money gets into the pay envelope. And I have found only one suggestion. There is a plank in the program which speaks of establishing a minimum or a living wage for women workers. And I suppose that we may assume that the principle is, in, is not in the long run meant to be confined in its application to women only. Perhaps we are justified in assuming that the third party looks forward to the general establishment by law of a minimum wage. It is very likely, I take it for granted, that if a minimum wage were established by law, the great majority of employers would take occasion to bring their wage scale as nearly as might be down to the level of that minimum. And it would be very awkward for the working man to resist that process successfully, because it would be dangerous to strike against the authority of the federal government. Moreover, most of his employers, at any rate practically all of the most powerful of them, would be wards and protégés of that very government, which is the master of us all. For no part of this program can be discussed intelligently without remembering that monopoly, as handled by it, is not to be prevented, but accepted and regulated. When you have thought the whole thing out, therefore, you will find that the program of the new party legalizes monopoly and of necessity subordinates working men to them and to the plans made by the government both with regard to employment and with regard to wages. Take the thing as a whole and it looks strangely like economic mastery over the very lives and fortunes of those who do the daily work of the nation and all this under the overwhelming power and sovereignty of the national government. What most of us are fighting for is to break up this very partnership between big business and the government. 